You're listening to Tim Bolkley's 5-Minute Bible. Ideal Readers, Part 2. Putting it all together. But in verse 9, where there's all the talk about the ascension of Jesus to heaven, there's also all this talk about he descended to the lower parts of the earth. What's this stuff about the descension of Jesus? There's no Descension Sunday that we celebrate in church. What's going on here? Some readers suspect it's the harrowing of hell. But I think if we look at Psalm 68, verse 18, we realize that that doesn't work. The psalm says, You ascended the high mount, leading captives in your train and receiving gifts from people, even those who rebel against the Lord God's abiding there. Quite clearly, this ascending, quite aside from the textual detail of who receives the gifts and who gives them, this ascending is about God, about Yahweh. And verses 17 and 19, if you care to look at them, underline that even more strongly. So, the passage he's quoting isn't about Jesus, it's about God the Father. But he applies it to Jesus. This is Trinitarian stuff, folks. You see, the question gets asked, if he ascended, then surely he must also have descended. When does God descend to the lower parts of the earth, to this base earth of ours? My reckoning is here that it's not talking about the harrowing of hell, but talking about just the sort of stuff that you get in that gorgeous hymn in Philippians chapter 2, which also talks about the dissension of God. Let the same mind be in you as was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's what's in mind here, the ascension and the dissension of Jesus. Okay. Now we come back to Ephesians chapter 4, and as we read through the chapter, we get echo upon echo of this ascension and dissension of Jesus stuff going on. And it colours and enables us to understand the stuff that's about us too. Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, you see what's going on? Paul, like Jesus, is descended. I therefore, a prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Hear the echoes of Philippians chapter 2, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Hear the echoes of Philippians. But to each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says, he ascended, hear the echoes of Philippians? What does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. Hear the echoes of Philippians? The gifts he gave were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Okay, so we, Christians who have these various callings, and notice that each of these callings in the church he's writing to, there are some of them who are this, so none of them is a calling to one person. We who have these various callings, we are the gifts that Jesus gives. Remember the picture? The conquering hero in the triumph, bringing the captives and the spoil. We are the captives and the spoil. We are the spoil that Jesus has brought with him. Because we've been plucked from captivity to sin and evil and death. And having been set free from these things, Jesus now gives us to each other. All that's going on in Ephesians 4. And you wouldn't know it unless you were an ideal reader. What does it mean to be an ideal reader? It means picking up the clues in the text. It means tripping over the things that sound boring and dull and saying, why are they there? 
They can't have been boring and dull, or they wouldn't be there. Why are they there? It means saying, what is the picture here? What are the first readers and hearers of this text meant to have heard in the echoes between the words? So, be an ideal reader, or at least try to be an ideal reader. See you next time.